Great. Welcome to Computer Science E259 XML with Java. My name is David Malin, and I will be your instructor for this semester. So XML, at the end of the day, this class is entirely about open bracket, close bracket. All right, so there's been a lot of hype over the past several years as to what XML is and what it can do. But what we want to do first and foremost tonight is dispense with some of the hype and the hyperbole. Because at the end of the day, XML quite simply is open bracket, close bracket. All right, you've seen this perhaps if, you've already, if you're already familiar with HTML or XHTML. And in the world of XML, that same idea applies, tags, open and close tags. But the curious thing is that out of this very simple construct, have there developed some really interesting technologies, some interesting file formats, and perhaps most importantly, some really useful and some really popular and some fairly robust software and software tools. So tonight is all about introducing, one, the course, Computer Science E259, but two, also the domain that we're going to play in this semester. It's in next week's lecture that we'll dive headfirst into two of the APIs that are most popular for accessing XML, uh, SACS being one, DOM being another, more on that a bit later tonight. And in the subsequent lectures, we'll continue to build upon some of the technologies and the tools that are ever more uh, popular and useful today. But first, some of the hype. So what I did was go, went through a bunch of websites online, some recent media and so forth from the past few months or years, and dug up some of the quotes that are perhaps all too often associated with this technology of open bracket, close bracket. One here, XML is a content-rich, data-neutral file format. It's probably the most important new techno technology development in the last two years. That was from InfoWorld. Another quote appears as an idea almost as good as peanut butter and chocolate from the XML EDI group. Another, <laughs> a spreading ooze of data will expand as people exchange data more easily with XML. Someone perhaps trying too hard to give a quote there. And then finally, I'm not even sure this one's appropriate, but XML is like sex even when it's bad it's still pretty good. So we showed these same quotes to students last year and the previous year and had them offer their own comments at the end of this course after they've been exposed to the types of material and tools and software and so forth that this course in particular tries to introduce students to. And a couple of the quotes that we got from our own students were ha perhaps a little more down to earth and a little more telling. The first was, <laughs> This too, student trying too hard perhaps to give us a good quote, but they made it into the lecture. XML is beautiful, but as with beautiful people, it is neither easy to get along with nor quick. So an interesting sort of commentary on performance, which actually is a very valid concern and something we'll address over the course of the semester. But I think perhaps the best quote from one of our own students that really captures what this course and really what this domain is all about is quite simply this. XML's strength is its wide adoption and excellent tools. XML itself is not that exciting. And it's perhaps the worst note to start a course on if we're about to say this course is about not that exciting, but you really do have some neat and some fun stuff coming out of this fairly simple concept. And what we try to do in this course is one, certainly acclimate you to what's out there and introduce you to the tools off the shelf that you can draw upon in work, for play, for your own software development, to some of the basic ideas and the fundamentals that underlie those tools implementations, but also the sort of domains that they play in. Languages like XML and XSLT and SVG and XQuery, XSLFO, and a whole suite of others that we'll touch upon briefly tonight all have some sort of interesting or curious foundations. And I think really what the goal of this course is, is not so much to just say, here's what XML is, and here's how you can download some popular software tool and use it, but rather give you an understanding of how it is this, this technology or this language works, or what it's intended for, or perhaps giving you a sense of how to answer questions of the form, why is my implementation that's somehow related to XML performing slowly? Or what are some of the design decisions or the, the thoughts that should go into my selection of these tools or these technologies for a project that I might be working on on my own or at work and so forth. So it's really meant to make you savvy in this domain so that come courses end, you are able yourself to confidently and intelligently and informedly decide, is this applicable, this language, this tool for what I want to do? And if not, what else is there out there for me? So with that said, what are the motivations for this course? So there remains a good deal of hype around XML, and everyone likes to say, oh, our application uses XML for this or that. But the truth of the matter is that there is actually value in what is ultimately open class, uh, open tag, 
close tag. And even some of these bullet points are, dare say, a bit of hyperbole, but we'll see by course's end that there really are some interesting domains in which these technologies can be applied. So XML is the primary technology behind the so-called B2B revolution. Right? If we tone that down a bit, all we're talking about really in that sense is XML is becoming an increasingly popular file format for transferring data among companies, among departments, among applications, not only in the enterprise, but even on your own computers, as file formats themselves become more extensible and more open and less proprietary over time. XML is the primary technology behind web services. This is a neat technology that's, that's catching on. I wouldn't say so much it's omnipresent, but when you look online at sites like Google's Code, site where they have a whole bunch of Google specific APIs. If you look on Amazon site, on eBay site, a number of uh, PayPal site, a number of these big engines, these big sites these days expose their own functionality to developers by way of APIs, many of which, dare say most of which these days are somehow XML based by way of something called web services or some variant thereof. All that means is that if you want to, for instance, implement your own sort of payment accepting or processing system within your own site using, for instance, PayPal system, well, underneath the hood is there very often XML at play, even though the code that you yourself might be using completely abstracts away from those details and instead gives you a purely Perl or PHP or CGI interface to what underneath the hood is XML, but we'll play on both of those levels in this course. XML, the primary technology behind Microsoft's .NET, something of similarly questionable um, success or omnipresence, but this is ostensibly the platform on which much of um, Windows-oriented software is developed or it's somehow related. Underneath the hood is there a lot of use even there of XML. XML makes developing websites easier and more flexible than ever before. Um, true in a number of different ways. But again, the goal of this course isn't necessarily to say use XML for X, Y, and Z, but rather here are some of the things you can use XML for and let's now engage in say a discussion or at least by way of the projects, a thought process as to which of these should actually be used and what problems can we actually solve with this spreading ooze of data. So what are the goals of this course? Well really to sort of dispense with some of the hype and really talk at a more um, down to earth level as to what can you do with XML, its derivatives, and ca what can we do in the domain particularly of Java, although much of what we do in this course is actually quite easily applicable to other domains, Perl, PHP, and so forth. Focus on practicality. All right, what is it you need to download? What is it you need to take off the shelf to actually use the stuff we're talking about? Applications. What precisely are the tools that are out there? What's most robust? What's most performant? What is most standard? out there today. And possibilities, and that's sort of the, the catch-all, exactly what is this stuff good for and what can you yourselves do with the material taught in this course after the course's end. And what we try to do is emphasize a lot of this material from the bottom up. For instance, case in point, if you've glanced at the syllabus or even project one in your hands, the, first, the course's first project is about having you implement part of an XML parser. And we'll spend more time on that tonight and next week. But an XML parser, curiously enough, is hopefully not something that after the course's end you will ever have to write again because the purpose of using something like XML and all of these off-the-shelf tools and technologies is so that you're not constantly reinventing the wheel and not in your own work coming up with some proprietary, even if simple, file format in which to store configuration data or corporate data. The purpose with XML for the most part is to build upon the work of others and to choose intelligently from the work of others. Finally, the rewards of the course, and this is sort of a list of the languages and or technologies that you should feel savvy or certainly exposed to by courses end, and we'll spend different amounts of time on each of these technologies um, over the course of the semester as seen in the projects. But you will gain experience with D B D uh, DTD, uh, SVG, XForms, XInclude, XLink, XML Base, XML Encryption, XML Key Management, XML Namespaces, XML Schema, XML Signature, XPath, XPointer, XQuery, XSFL, oh, almost had it, XS, XSLFO, and XSLT. And again, we'll spend different amounts of times on these technologies, but the juiciest of them, perhaps, are the ones we'll spend the most time on. XSLT, in particular, is a wonderfully useful language that itself is written in XML that can be used not only in sort of server-side, website-oriented applications, but even in command-line scripting type applications. It's a wonderful tool for something like that. As I mentioned earlier, SACS and DOM, these are the two APIs 
that we'll begin the course with. And by API here, I mean what are the standard interfaces via which you can use XML and write software that somehow makes use of XML. Then we'll move on later in the course to two APIs called JAXP and TRAX, the Java API for XML processing, which is sort of a catch-all for all code in the Java JDK, really. Um, it's standardized now, but all the code in the Java JDK that's somehow related to XML, and a subset of that is something called the Transformation API for XML, which really includes languages like XSLT, or the processing thereof. And I know I'm just tossing out a lot of acronyms tonight and a lot of words starting with X, but the point of the semester is to begin to tease these things apart. So don't worry if this quick over, uh, overview is in itself by nature fast. We'll spend time in the latter half of the course on what's really J2EE, Java 2 Enterprise Edition of Java. And by this we mean we'll move from developing some client-centric software and applications and tools and so forth to things entirely server-side. And more on that in our discussion tonight of the course's projects. But one of the curious things about this course, even though the common thread throughout the course is XML and what you can do with it and with variants of it, as a sort of intentional side effect of the course. We spend a good amount of time in the world of Java and specifically in the world of server-side application development such that we have students in the past who have come into the course with maybe one semester, two semesters of Java experience. That is doable. The course is doable, I would say, with that kind of background, but I will caution for those of you who might have precisely that experience, just one semester or two semesters, perhaps here at Extension with E50A or E50B, I would caution that unless you're entering this course as someone who is a comfortable programmer, whether it's in Java or some other language, you'll likely spend more time throughout the semester on programming specific issues rather than course specific issues. And that's fine, but just appreciate that the time invested for a student like that might be on average higher than a student who comes in sort of ready to program and comfortable with Java programming. But with that said, even for those of you who have a good amount of experience with Java, one of the fun aspects of the course is that because we begin come mid-semester or a third of the way in to play with things server-side, what you exit the course with is an understanding of servlet containers or application um, servers, synonyms for the most part, specifically in the world of Java with JSPs and again with Java servlets. So what you'll do is exit the course not only with broad exposure to all things XML, but really with some technologies and languages that are standard for a lot of um, enterprise-oriented software. Um, certainly, as an aside, during break tonight or afterwards, if you have, are among those students with less of the programming background, by all means, come up and chat. Um, but we'll talk a bit more in the context of the projects as to what's assumed and what languages or experiences assumed. We'll spend time, too, on HTTP itself and cookie handling mechanisms and session-oriented mechanisms, uh, things that are applicable, certainly, in J2EE, but also, again, in other languages. CGI, PHP have similar constructs to offer. SOAP, web services, and WSDL, all related to this notion of web services. And then some pretty popular or pretty common tools, some of which are listed here. In fact, if you take a look after tonight, at the course's website, and we'll come back to this in a bit too, the course's website is meant to be a, a veritable portal for you, for everything related to the course, particularly the software, either suggested by or used in the course. And what you'll notice is that on the course website software page are their links, password protected, to a number of uh, six or so month licenses for some pretty popular products like XML Spy, for a program called Oxygen, and one called Stylus Studio, all of which will I'll likely demo during the course of the semester. Don't necessarily promote one way or the other, but are otherwise pretty expensive products to buy yourself off the shelf. So these companies have been kind enough to offer us a semester-long trial, essentially fully functional trial that you can use to, um, one, make your lives easier during the semester, but two, just get a sense of what's out there as well, what might be useful after the course. So computer science E259, what we'll do tonight is give you a sense of, one, the, sense, uh, the extent to which we'll be playing with Java in the course and just how Java-centric the course will be, particularly around the EE in Java. Um, spend a little bit of time on XML, some of which might already be familiar to you. So you've already seen something like that before. What we're going to do tonight is just introduce some of the basic building blocks, the jargon, the terminology, so that next week we hit the ground running with a discussion of SACs, APIs, and particularly Project One. And we'll come back tonight as to a few logistical issues. But before we dive too head on, any questions that you don't anticipate us hitting before long? 
questions, concerns? Well, let me do this, lest this be too much of me talking. Let me, because it's always a little awkward the first night of a class, I'm not going to make you all introduce yourselves to the class because there's a few too many of us here, but let me pause speaking for, say, 60 seconds, and let me force you to say hello to the one or two people next to you. Just have a one-minute chat, say maybe who you are or what you do for a living while you're taking the course, to perhaps take the edge off of the first course so that you feel next week when you come back, you at least have a familiar face to sit next to. So I'm going to go quiet for 60 seconds. All right. Conversation was just starting to taper off, so we can uh, relieve you of that. Hopefully that's a bit of a, a stress reliever. Maybe you now have a sense of whether uh, you know more than the person next to you or less, and you won't so much be wondering when you ask questions. Uh, just assume everyone knows less, and then it's okay so, to ask your questions. Um, so, XML and Java, J2E in particular. So, J2EE is perhaps best defined by way of its API. So this thing here is a link to the Java doc to what is officially a Java 2 Enterprise Edition version 5.0. And Java doc, if you're not so familiar with it or comfortable with it, is actually something we'll be using really indirectly in this course a huge amount of time. I would wager that lectures would not be terribly interesting if my job up here were to point out to you the many methods that can do X, Y, and Z and the interfaces that you should be using to program A, B, and C. Rather, what we'll try to do in lectures is certainly give you exposure to the APIs that we'll be using in the course's lectures and the course's projects will give you a lot of demonstration code. So among the handouts each week will usually be a packet of sample code that I'll play with up here, but then you can also reference at home. The projects themselves all come with a distribution tree of source code itself, all of which I've tried terribly hard to comment nearly every line of code. So uh, practice, uh, this is a rare form for me. So to practice as I'm trying to preach. Um, but the Java doc in particular, will be wonderfully useful in this domain because a lot of what we'll be playing with is precisely this APIs. And there will be a huge suite of classes and methods and interfaces that we'll be using during the semester. But the point really with project one and with project two is to really take any of the fear factor that you might still have, any of the dauntingness that this might impose on you when you glance at something as god long as this thing. Well, you'll see that something like this, particularly in the context of XML, becomes very easy to navigate. And a lot of the questions that you might have over time can odds are be answered simply by hyperlinking through some of these documents. But we'll point you in the direction of some of these documents as time goes on. What is J2EE itself then? Well, it's sort of all of this code, all of these classes and all of these interfaces that you can sort of scroll through here as provided by Sun. Java 2 Enterprise Edition is really about all of the code uh, distributed by Sun that lets you do enterprise-oriented software development. If you only have a semester or two of Java experience, you've probably used what's instead just called Java 2 Second Edition, which is really just a subset of Enterprise Edition. And it's pretty much Java without all of the server-side specific libraries and code. And so as such, it's a smaller bunch of code. But frankly, even in the J2SE Edition, if you've been programming in that for zero or more semesters, even you probably have not taken a look at all of the classes and APIs and um, interfaces that ship with that. The point is, in this course, there'll be even more than these, but we will only be using a fraction of what's really in J2EE. Toward that end, as Project One advises you, what you won't be doing is downloading the JDK for Java 2 Enterprise Edition. Essentially, it's overkill. It's got way more code, way more distractions than we're going to use in the course. So rather, with Project One and beyond, we'll have you download, if you haven't it already, Java 2 Second Edition, that JDK, and then we'll simply add on to it via separate downloads, those aspects of J2EE that we'll be using throughout the semester. Um, foreshadowing this, one of the um, popular software packages that we'll be making great use of in projects three and four is an application server called Apache Tomcat. And that is an implementation of a component of J2EE, but we'll download the latest and greatest and most stable version of that when the time comes. But you'll see in project one that the project specs really try hard to hold your hand um, through the process of, one, getting yourself up and running, whether on Harvard server or on your own machine. And more on that later tonight. So here it is, XML. Before I reveal with the wave of the PowerPoint and without looking down on your own large slides tonight, what is it? 
in more words than open tag, close tag. Give me anything. Sorry? Okay, so it's an it's extensible markup language. What does that mean? Good. So it's a language that allows you to define your own rules for laying out and presenting data. And let's come actually back to the definition itself. So extensible markup language. So you've all probably seen one other markup language at least, namely HTML or XHTML. They're very similar. In fact, XHTML is simply a subset of uh, XML, as we'll see this semester. And what does it mean in the context of web pages to have a markup language? I mean, what does it mean to mark up a document? Yeah, so it's pretty much the addition of metadata to a document that somehow communicates exactly what type of data the software should assume this data is. Is it the head? Is it the body? Or rather, how should this data be displayed? Should it be displayed with a B emphasis, with a bold facing? Should it be displayed with italics or so forth? So markup really refers to marking up the actually important data with data that's more semantic in nature, more metadata. Well, XML really just takes that to another to the extreme, whereas in, XM, whereas in HTML and XHTML, you have only predefined tags that browsers are assumed to understand, and you may only define or use those tags, assuming you want to be uh, in accordance with the specification. XML puts all that control in your hands. You can define a tag called XML. You can define a tag called David, a tag called computer. You can define any tags you want depending on what your goal is. And the goal really typically with XML is to add some kind of semantic information to a document that helps you or really helps a computer process that information intelligently. And we'll see some examples of that in just a moment. If we want to tease apart things a bit more formally, it is in fact a language for creating other languages. Almost every one of the languages that started with the letter X on a previous slide was implemented itself in XML. That is to say, one of the first languages we'll look at in this course, XSLT, Extensible Style Sheet Transformations, that is a language that itself is written in XML. With that said, XML lets you define schemas for tag-based languages. That is to say, you can come up with your own tags, and you can sort of define a standard that your software or other people's software should conform to. In fact, what is HTML really these days? What is XHTML really? Well, it's a standard implemented by way of what's called the DTD, which is something we'll get to later in the course, that pretty much says what tags are, va are valid and in what order they must come if they come at all in a document. So XML just puts that control entirely in your hands. Finally, XML allows you to extend any ex existing language or schema with your own tags. And therein lies its extensibility. And that is to say, you can often augment your language without breaking current implementations. And that is a huge gain, a huge plus for what ultimately is a fairly simple uh, application. So what do we mean by schemas? Well, financial transactions. That is to say, you could define an XML-based language that has a whole bunch of tags, all of which are related to finance somehow. A price tag, a quote tag, a quantity tag, anything related to, for instance, stock transactions, a buy price, an ask price. Well, you might define using something like DTD or a language called XML schema, which we'll also cover in the course, a standard via which applications might communicate that sort of information. If you use, for instance, a program like Microsoft um, Money or Quicken, well, those programs often allow you to download financial information from your banks and from credit card institutions. Well, if the format in which that data were not being delivered standardized, well, that whole idea wouldn't really work very well. And so what XML allows you to do is to standardize the format in which data is communicated among applications or computers. Business documents, purchase orders, a wonderfully canonical example because inherent in the idea of a purchase order is someone's address and name and bill to address and credit card number. A lot of very discrete pieces of information that you don't want to just send as clear text to a server and let it parse it appropriately. Rather, it's useful to say these sequence of, this sequence of five letters, D-A-V-I-D, is a first name. And you could tag that with open bracket, first name, close bracket. That's the general idea of what we mean by schemas. Remote procedure calls. This is perhaps one of the techier and cooler uses of XML where you can implement software on, say, a server 
but interface with that library that you've deployed on the server via some piece of client software. That is to say, one of the things we'll do in this course is play around with web services, which really is just a fancy name for a very old notion, remote procedure calls, but that uses XML to transmit data from one computer to the other transparently to you, the programmer. You can just call foo, and foo will actually get executed on some remote computer. And foo's arguments and return value will actually be marshaled back and, cross, back and forth across the network using XML. Configuration files, such a silly, simple little thing. Wouldn't think you'd want to take a class on how to write better configuration <laughs> files, but it's such a wonderful language in general, using XML and its derivatives, even to whip up quick and dirty applications or configuration files, because again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. That is to say, you don't have to write your own parser for your comma-separated file format, for your uh, colon-separated file format. If you look in a typical Linux system at all of the dot files and so forth, c shirk files and so forth, all of these configuration files tend to use some different standard. And that's fine, but it just meant it was more effort implementing the code that actually parsed those files. Being able to take something off the shelf like an XML parser and just say, you deal with the parsing of this config file and just give me back the data values I want, it's just a time saver, if nothing else. And simple little things like that really begin to add up and make something like XML and these derivatives actually useful stuff. Well, where is it that XML comes from? And where is it that these X HTML and HTML standards come from these days? Well, it's a group, part of which is housed down the road at MIT, the World Wide Web Consortium. So I offer this not so much as a history lesson, but just so that you have an understanding when you begin to look at specs online during this course and even after exactly what it means if XSLT version 2.0 is in the candidate recommendation status. Well, the W3C is essentially a group of folks who draft the standards for language li languages like XML and XSLT and HTML and XHTML and essentially declare to the world if you are going to support X, uh, XHTML 1.0, you must have your browser support this specification. Now, unfortunately, many of the browsers do that, but then add things like the blink tag from yesteryear, or they, re they misinterpret or interpret differently certain aspects of those specifications, but ultimately those specifications for what we know as HTML and so forth come from this particular group. And ironically, once a specification has reached its final status, that is to say it is a finalized standard, well then it's actually just called a recommendation officially. So perhaps that's why Netscape and Microsoft and, and so forth have sometimes taken liberties with, implementa uh, with interpretations here. But what's useful for us in a course like this is just to have an appreciation as to what it means if a spec is in one of these different levels. For instance, XSLT 2.0 is better, shall we say, than XSLT 1.0, if only because it adds a number of features that many people feel are missing from 1.0. XSLT 2.0 has not been uh, in recommendation status just yet, and for perhaps four years in this course, we keep hoping that we'll officially turn to XSLT 2.0 because of the number of features that it offers, but at least as of last time I pulled up the website in preparing the first few lectures for the course, not yet finalized. And that's fine, because there do exist implementations of the standard, even though last time I checked it was in candidate recommendation status. The danger, though, is if you're developing software, or implementing something for some important application, and you're choosing some language off the shelf and an implementation thereof, if the darn thing changes the next day or the next month, you just have to be appreciative of the kinds of implications that that has. So what we try to do in this course in particular is focus on really what's standardized and what software you can trust is stable, well adopted, and so forth. But we'll see this in the context of these documents over the course of the semester. And all these arrows means is that when you want to come up with a new standard, it starts at this status. Once a bunch of people have agreed that it's pretty good, it goes to this status. Once a few more people have said, yeah, we like it, it gets to this status, this status. But too often, like, uh, shoots and ladders, it ends up coming all the way back down and they work their way back up for several years at a time. All right, so XML, where did it come from? So in 1996, that group, the W3C, came up with a list of 10 goals. And we're not going to go over the goals of each and every language, but these are perhaps rather telling for XML itself because you'll see some of these themes coming up throughout the semester as we touch upon a number of these languages. So the first and foremost goal was that XML shall be straightforwardly usable over the internet. 
compelling, and pretty much actualized in several of its variants. Two, XML shall support a wide variety of applications. Absolutely true. Three, XML shall be compatible with SGML. SGML is an older language that aspires to do similar things, much more complicated than XML is, but XML is an instance of SGML. So it's essentially a smaller piece of what's a fairly ugly puzzle. Four, it shall be easy to write programs which process XML documents. I would say that that's quite true, and in fact, that is one of the most compelling features of this whole domain in the first place. The number of optional features in XML is to be kept to the absolute minimum, ideally zero. Eh, we'll see how well they adhere to that. XML documents shall be human legible and reasonably clear. This too, curiously enough, one of these simple things like better configuration files that really in the real world is compelling. Being able to develop some application that simply uses XML as its network-based file format for transmission, frankly, just tends to make development of that software so much easier and so much nicer because it just removes a layer of complexity for you, the developer, because you can just look inside of those packets or sniff the entire transaction or just log the entire transaction and there's everything in the clear. Now, granted, you pay a potential performance cost in that you're sending larger pieces of data, data that needs to be parsed, but again, it depends on what your cost metrics are. If it's more expensive or more annoying to you to have to spend more development time in something, then you might be willing to allow for a bit of a performance hit for certain applications. Seven, the XML design shall be prepared quickly. Maybe this one was. The others uh, have yet to be actualized so fast. Eight, the design of XML shall be formal and concise. That's true, and we'll look at some of the formal definitions by way of project one, albeit in simplified form. Nine, the XML documents shall be easy to create. Absolutely true. And this is sort of the funny one. And this is one you'll come to appreciate all too well. Terseness in XML markup is of minimal importance. And boy, boy did they make that one a success. Um, you will have in this course fairly verbose documents and you have fairly verbose languages. Again, the implication of which is perhaps a performance cost um, the upside of which is clarity. So it's, again, always a trade-off. So keep those in mind just over the course of the semester because if nothing else, it will explain why you experience some good things and perhaps some frustrations as well. So they, they are features, they are not bugs, perhaps. So just to put this into context, XML itself has been around since 98 officially. That's when the first recommendation hit recommendation status. It was sort of uh, improved or refined in 2004. But what these dates should give you a sense of is just that what you're involved with here or what you're considering with this course is something that is pretty new, um, still pretty current, and still constantly changing. Um, how? All right. So here we go. Now we actually have a bit of XML, an easy bit of XML, but just so that we can level the playing field and introduce some of the jargon that we're just going to start assuming here on out. So this is an instance of XML. It's a sample document and should jump right out at you. What kind of document does this seem to be? Sorry? Yeah, it's something, it's like a book order, a purchase order. All right, these seem to be tags that have been color coded just to make them stand out a bit more clearly. But really, this is just some markup, right? Some interesting data or some you know, core data is in there with some guy's name and an ID number and a sold on date and a price and then uh, the title of whatever this book was. But it's semantically tagged in such a way that not only human can determine what all these pieces of data are, but more importantly, a computer can simply be instructed by way of the document what types of data are actually in there. And then ideally, the computer can hand to the human, that is the programmer, for instance, an object or an array or some kind of entity that simply has all of these fields tagged accordingly with, for instance, uh, member variables, to put it into simple context. What's some of the jargon here? All right. Henceforth, any time we talk about everything between an open tag, as it's called, and a closed tag, well, that's going to be called an element. So an element is something that includes, that can include children, descendants, and so forth. But order, in this case, is an element. The body tag, if you sort of conceptually couple it with its closed body tag in an HTML document, that too is an element. So when we say tag, we just mean the syntax thereof, but the element is sort of the conceptual entity. This is a book. This is a sold to object or element. All right. Um, 
child element should be fairly self-explanatory. We've indented as many people tend to do in HTML for human readability. All this indentation, all this white space to a computer, meaningless for the most part. It's a bit of a white lie, and we'll come back to that in our discussion of DTDs and schemas. But for the most part, this is ever more human readable because of the white space. But for the most part, it's uninteresting. This is the first element that comes inside of the order element. So it's what we would call a child or descendant element. This thing, again, is a start tag. This is a close tag and the, and, or an end tag. And there are a whole bunch of other instances of those, just like in HTML. Tags or elements, really, can have attributes. And those attributes must have values. And the thing about XML, which you might not be used to if you're a bit loose with your HTML coding, is that XML must be what's called well-formed. And this is something we will come back to next week. But really what that means is whereas in HTML you can have tags, uh, maybe having, um, having an attribute but not having an equal sign or quotes thereafter, uh-uh doesn't work in XML. What you see here is a sort of representative document. Anytime you have attributes, you immediately have an equal sign, open quote, something, close quote. But we'll come back to that formality in the future. HTML, you can have things like open bracket, TD, space, no wrap, close bracket. That's not valid in XML, and it's a bit looser. And what XHTML is, incidentally, because it's an instance of XML, all that really means it's a cleaned up version of HTML 4.0 but this is, this is more trivia than it is useful information. Finally, the actual content of your document, we would typically call text, and we'll see why it's called text um, in our discussion of DOM. Any questions at this point? Simple example, but frankly, now you know XML. The more interesting question is, what can you do with this, and how can you do that? All right, so what was it, though, about this extensibility? And again, this, too, I'm trying to avoid using cheesy terms like the value add of XML, but really the value you get out of using something like XML for the, the marking up of your content is a feature known as extensibility. That is to say, if you decide months down the road, you know what, I need this config file, I need this RPC to include additional information that wasn't there earlier, a very simple but very powerful feature of laying out data in XML format is that you can just add it. And because of the way XML parsers and processors tend to be implemented, this does not break existing software. If all of a sudden your data transmission or your configuration file all of a sudden has additional information that wasn't there previously. Sort of like in the world of HTML where if a browser encounters a tag, like the blink tag that it doesn't understand, it just gets ignored. Well, that's sort of an inherent feature in XML-based applications in that if they encounter data that they don't quite expect, but it is syntactically well-formed, well, it just gets ignored and the application doesn't crash. You don't have to go in and change your code necessarily. You can simply adapt it later on if you so choose. Now there are exceptions to that because you can impose constraints such that if there's data in the document that shouldn't be there, that can trigger an error. So there are ways to sort of impose a restriction on such extensibility. It looks like there's two ways to represent a string of text. One is as an attribute, like the first ID, and the other one is open last name, close last name. An excellent point. So it looks like for the camera that there are two ways to represent pieces of data or text, either as values of attributes or as the children, the sole children of what we would call a leaf node, a leaf element. So we'll actually co come back to this next week, but you know, just to toss the question out to the audience, that's true, I'll say that much, but why might you choose one implementation, an attribute, over the other, just intuitively? Yeah, oh, that's uh, behind you, Sorry. it's okay. Sure, sure, perfectly valid and very reasonable, very common explanation. Again, to repeat that it is simply, attributes tend to be used for sort of tangential data, data that's not really core to what you're trying to represent. In this case, what we're really trying to represent is David Malin's purchase. Who really cares that David Malin's automatically assigned ID number is one, two, three? That's sort of meta metadata in some sense. And that's a very reasonable argument. Why might we not want to put data in an attribute. Yep. If you have more than one, that's quite true. In XML, you cannot have identically named attributes. 
having different values. We'll come back to that next week, but that itself is a good point. Yep. You want to display it. You want to display it. That's actually not, uh, display it in what sense? So I'll, I'll jump in. I don't think that would be so much a concern because no matter how it's stored as attribute or as child, text child, you can still display it because the uh, an XML par uh, parser, as you'll see in project one, is just as capable of displaying or printing attributes as it is these leaf nodes. It's easier to read, like in this format? Sure. So that's certainly valid too. It's easier to read than just having one element called person with an attribute called first, a second attribute called last, a third attribute called middle. It's just a little more readable, and that in itself is a valid reason. What was the, uh, the contribution of this slide? It was all about, okay, indentation, but extensibility. Which of these two representations, though, is it that gives you the extensibility? Sorry? Exactly. So, Perfect. So exactly. So what you be, if one of your goals is to allow for extensibility, just in the future, if you choose a, an attribute and its value for your mode of representation, that's it. The buck stops there. There is no way to extend sort of the structure in an attribute because an attribute, as this sort of suggests, is really something that's atomic. It's something very simple that conceptually really can't or shouldn't be broken down further into parts. So. For instance, an ID number is sort of an ID number. That's it. There's really no way to tease other aspects of that apart, though you could make certain arguments. But a name, by contrast, that sort of inherently has different conceptual components. The name's first name, the name's last name, the name's middle name. So as such, if you suspect in the future that there might be cause to sort of tease apart some of the values that you're representing into it further semantically tagged values, but you sort of have to go with tags in that sense and not just attributes. But at the end of the day, it's a design decision. And whether or not it matters really depends on the goal at hand. Yeah. So do attributes tend to be used more for key fields in databases? Do attributes tend to be used more as key fields? I would say yes, but tend to is sort of a, it's a hard question to answer because at the end of the day, a lot of it boils down to internal representation issues. And at the end of the day, too, it doesn't really matter because programmatically you can get at both types of data fairly easily. What we will see, though, next week when we talk about SACS, which is the simple API for XML, uh, being simple sometimes comes with its price. And one of the downsides of using SACS, as we'll see, is that it makes it relatively harder to get at the children of an element, whereas it makes it easy to get at the attributes. And that'll make more sense in context and with some sample code. But again, that too is sort of what this course tries to do is to sort of put the facts in front of you and the conceptual understanding of how it all works, not only how the language markup works, but how the parser and the processors are going to work so that you're making educated decisions when it comes to these designs. Yeah? Is there anything is there anything you can do with an attribute that you cannot do with a tag? And you can always catch me, I'm sure, with some obscure corner case. But I'll go out on a limb and say, no, um, not inherently. So it's, uh, if we think about you know, the notion of computability and what kind of data you can represent, for instance, it doesn't fundamentally change what you can do representing data with an attribute as opposed to a child. But in the real world, when it comes to actually using these APIs and tools, it makes a practical difference as to how much effort you need to expend. But fundamentally, no. No, no. In fact, the, the fact that we've spent five or so minutes on this already is perhaps overemphasizing the design decision at hand here. And um, though uh, two semesters ago, we spent about 10 minutes on the discussion of white space, which, whoo, that was a fun one. Um, sort of technically interesting, but man, did it give the impression that white space is important, which as we'll see, it's, it's not really. But good questions. And the sort of the fun thing 
if you're a real geek, I think, that comes out of this course and the kinds of things we play at, is that the more savvy and comfortable you get with these things, the more these questions really do have specific answers and you can say, yes, this is better because the spec says this. And actually looking at some of the specifications, as we'll encourage you to do on occasion during the semester, is a useful exercise because if you're really looking for the definitive answer, Google is not necessarily your friend. Usenet is not necessarily your, your savior. Rather, the W3C's website and the specification will usually tell you what the answer actually is. And that rather abstract notion will become more clear as I think you probably yourselves pose questions over the semester and we ourselves turn to the spec to answer it. Anything else? All right, so what's one of the other reasons for using XML? Not just extensibility, so forth, and portability of information, but one of the originally touted visions for XML was to really simplify the process of making websites, specifically websites for views on different devices and different displays. Right? Many of you in the room probably have cell phones that allow you to display some variant of the World Wide Web on your phone, whether it's with some WML, wireless markup language, or WAP browser, or whether it's just a really dumbed down version of IE or Firefox or some browser, but that manipulates a 240 pixel screen. Well, one of the value adds of XML originally was sort of envisioned to be the ability to hand to a browser or equivalent piece of software the data that you wanted it to display and the stylization thereof. In other words, a, a browser might get two documents, an XML document that had all of the titles, all of the ratings, all of the reviews of, say, all of the movies that Blockbuster.com can allow you to rent online, and in the other file, a style sheet, if you will, would be all of the aesthetic information that tells the browser how to render the actual content. The upside of this, of course, is that now you can simply store all of your data or lay out all of your data, say in XML format on the server, just hand that data to the client and then let the client deal with the rendering for its specific constraints, screen size, colors, speed, and so forth. Um, and relieve, therefore, the server to some extent of the, the headache of trying to figure out what, based on the HTTP user agent, browser is the user using, let's now generate this version of the page and then down, ship down a version in WML or HTML. So that was sort of one of the original visions. And in fact, browsers like IE can render an XML document using a style sheet, an XSLT style sheet. In fact, when you pull up a random XML document these days, uh, we can go to, uh, let's see if we can pick a random one. So if we go to, I'll take you to a, uh, the wrong courses website. We'll come back to this topic in a bit. So this is, <laughs> all right. Good, haven't really used IE7 before, so I'm gonna make up this explanation as we go. Here's Internet Explorer 7. I've just pulled up an RSS file, a really simple syndication. It also has several different definitions because no one ever agreed what RSS stands for, but the point is that it's an XML document. The older version of IE would have showed us an XML version of this document, not unlike the color-coded thing we just looked at for that Harry Potter purchase order. The means by which it did that was to apply a very simple style sheet written in a language called XSLT to the XML document and it just gave you a very simple, you know, nicely tabbed and formatted view of the XML data. Looks like Microsoft has changed that style sheet for uh, Internet Explorer 7 such that the default XSLT style sheet or equivalent that now renders XML documents by default specifically RSS files, is to sort of interpret all of that actual core content based on the semantic tags surrounding it and display it in this much granted prettier version. Prettier, yes, but not nearly as uh, explanatory as I had intended. If we at least go, hopefully they left the view source menu, perhaps. There we go. So if we go to the view source menu, of course, now we have the backslash R backslash N issue at play. This is an XML document. That's the XML, but there is no aesthetic markup in there. There is no information that's telling IE to use blue and put lines underneath there, then put these green arrows and so forth. All of that is coming from an external source. And the point is, it's coming from a style sheet written presumably in XSLT if they've been conformant to what they did in IE6, or they might be using some other style sheet language now. But what it does capture is this idea in that what I've only downloaded is the actual core content and I've sort of left the rendering 
to the browser, to the client itself. Now, a, a potential downside and sort of a real world downside is that when you leave the rendering of content up to the browser, or up to the user really, the browser, what you then start to get is standardization issues and it doesn't really look the same on all systems and plus do you really want to be sending all of say your movie database just so that the client can render part of it and plus by shipping down all of your actual core content you're making it much easier for people say to do the equivalent of screen scrape your data and for a business that itself might not necessarily be something you want to facilitate really right if you're putting something out on the web anyone can scrape it and figure out what the data means and sort of retroactively add the semantic information if you're trying to do a meta search engine for instance and compile Yahoo's results and Google's results all together like dogpile.com does something similar years ago it used to use just screen scraping to do that well that's if nothing else, a nuisance for, say, a competitor. So shipping down all of your actual core content, not necessarily a wise thing. So in the reality, you don't really see XML and XSLT being used on the client side. What you've begun seeing done, though, is XSLT being used on the server side, such that you'll use XSLT to render your XHTML on the server, but then you'll send the XHTML to the user. So sort of same idea but rendered in an environment that you yourself have control over and we'll see that in projects too and beyond. Application integration, another why and perhaps a final why as to why XML is just useful. So those of you who are full-time software developers and perhaps work in larger organizations where different departments have different systems and you have to pay consultants ridiculous fees to come in often and interface these systems to another or bring in some new major software product or database or financial management system and just the process of tying that new product or software into your existing systems is too often expensive or time consuming. Well just one of the advantages that the world is starting to see is more and more software begins to expose its content and its files as, and its data as XML format is it just gets much easier to stitch applications together. Even MySQL, a very popular SQL database, allows you to expose that data if you want or export it for instance in XML format because then you can import it into software that isn't necessarily some other alternative SQL database. So just little things like that are becoming increasingly compelling and what all this silly PowerPoint animation is suggesting is that if you start having software that sort of exposes a common front something that's say XML formatted it makes it much easier to start tying things together and the, that is why there are, exist increasingly num, uh, an increasing number of tools that you can download off the shelf and use in completely disparate contexts or completely different types of software because at the end of the day they're just using the very simple building block and the funny thing is you know it shouldn't have taken the world till 1998 to come up with you know, open bracket, close bracket. And the funny thing is, pretty much none of these advantages that we've enumerated have, were made all of a sudden possible in recent years. It's just that you've seen a gradual shift, I think, really among software developers and server-side software that people are just starting to use this more commonly. And even though you could have implemented all of these same notions in other types of software that have existed for years, for instance, um, COM and DCOM, CORBA, Java RMI, all of these technologies, some of which you yourself might have used, that allow you to implement essentially remote procedure calls, well, for the most part, those mechanisms were propri proprietary or they were tied to specific languages and to specific software products. And that itself, though usable, wasn't necessarily extensible, wasn't necessarily applicable to other software or other skills one might bring to the table. And so one of the, as our student early on in the lecture sort of captured the, the spirit of Apple, is that the fact that everyone else is sort of starting to use this and is simply using an open standard, something that's extensible, something that's purely text-based, something that's human readable, something that granted might not necessarily be parsable as quickly as other smarter sort of domain specific representations of data, that commonality is what's really making it something that's compelling and something that's useful to pull off of the shelf. Pretty much none of the problems that we will solve in this course's projects have become solvable because of XML. They're simply solvable in a different way and in a way that allows you to apply, I think, those same solutions to other problem domains altogether. Questions?
on XML or anything related there too. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and take a, a five-minute chit-chat, cookie break, bathroom break, and then we'll conclude tonight with an overview of the course, prerequisites, um, projects, what's involved, so that when you exit tonight, you'll know exactly what you may have gotten yourself into. Come back in five. All right. We are back. So thus concludes tonight's introduction to content related to XML, but what is the course all about and what are we going to dive into next week? So the only prerequisites for this course is that we assume a comfort with Java and with HTML or XHTML. Not that you couldn't pick up certainly the latter two on your own overnight, but simply the conversations we'll have, the sort of assumptions we'll make in lectures and on the projects is that when we say go make a web page that looks like this, you know how or you're prepared to go figure out how to make a web page look like that. Um, any online reference or HTML or XHTML book could prove a useful resource, but this is not something you should fret over if you've never written a web page before. But you would be as expected to go figure that out, say, by next week. Um, really not that hard of a language to pick up. Certainly the basics, that's what's important. Java, this is sort of the more interesting question. We will make assumptions in this course that if we say go code up a linked list, you'll know one, what that means, and two, have a rough idea of how to go do it. If not three, be done doing it by the time I'm done asking it. So we sort of, we're sort of able to allow for different levels of savvy coming into this course, but just realize if you're on the lower end, as I said before, you'll probably find yourself spending more time on the course's projects and probably, probably finding the projects harder sort of by nature than they're meant to be. So just appreciate that. You're welcome to continue in the course even if you have just a bit of Java experience or you're a really versed programmer in some other language and are willing to sort of figure out how to apply one language to this new context. Um, but Java 2 is what we don't assume for instance, is that you have any exposure or familiarity with the J2EE stuff. So when I mentioned servlets and JSPs before, that's fine. We assume that you don't have that coming into the course. When we say, if you never even knew what J2EE was, well, that's fine. What we do assume is that you're familiar with what we would call J2SE. And I certainly don't mean all of the libraries, but you know Java. If, that, if Java's on your resume, you better be able to know what we're doing in this course. Um, with that said, what are the expectations? Quite few. Well, that's the wrong way to put that. <laughs> quite, quite simple. Um, attend or watch all of the lectures, complete four assigned projects, and design and implement a final project. Um, the grade, we'll come back to each of those in a moment. The grades will be entirely based on how your submissions go with these five projects. Uh, the final project will be weighted slightly heavier than the other four projects and simply refer to the syllabus for the exact enumeration of those values. You'll notice that atop each of the projects this semester there will be a point total at top. That is relatively speaking. Each of the projects, one, two, three, four, are equally weighted. So if one is worth 137 points and next one is worth 200 points, that doesn't mean that it's fundamentally worth more. It's just a relative value. So just bear that in mind lest you get led astray. Um, the lectures. So tonight is meant, again, just to be an introduction. Next week we'll dive head force into XML itself and some of the basic definitions and also the first of those two APIs, namely SAC. So by the end of that lecture you'll have a sense, um, not only conceptually, but also with actual sample and demonstration code, exactly how you can write a little application that uses XML to get at the data, to process the data, to represent um, some kind of data. In lecture three we'll spend time on DOM. DOM is something that you actually have in the domain of web browsers and HTML and XHTML, but unless you've done a good amount of um, website development with JavaScript or Ajax, you've probably never had to bother understanding or knowing much about DOM, but DOM is simply a tree-based representation of a web page, so long as that web page is written in, say, XHTML or XML more broadly. So DOM is a way of representing and accessing information in XML as though that XML um, were a hierarchical tree. Right? Sort of inherent in all that indentation was the sort of perhaps intuitive notion that you could consider that top element a root element and all of those children elements literally were children in a tree that themselves had further descendants. DOM's all about representing an XML document as a tree. In lectures four and five, we'll spend time on two of the most useful languages, I think, certainly for quick and dirty application, but even for some server-side stuff, namely XPath, which is a sort of simple query language that lets you write a fairly intuitive expression, and take that with a grain of salt, come lecture four, 
um, that allows you to grab arbitrary data from an XML document, but using sort of a path-based syntax, just like you might type C colon backslash program files backslash office to get at a file in your Microsoft Office folder. We'll see a similar syntax if you want to get at the first name in the name element, in the person element, in the purchase order element that kind of idea. XSLT, again, is that transformative language whereby you can take an XML document and convert it into another XML document, a web page, a text document, really any kind of output document that you wish. And we'll see why that might be useful. Lecture six, we'll introduce a bit about namespaces, but more interestingly, SVG, scalable vector graphics. This is an XML-based uh, graphical markup language that allows you to implement graphics by way of lines, polygons, shapes, um, not something that you see terribly in use, for instance, with web pages, typically because it requires some additional plugin, but as a sort of specialized tool, it's a really neat language, and we'll discuss that in a moment with regard to project two. Um, XSLFO is sort of a scarier version of an XML language, um, XSL extensible style sheet language formatting objects that allows you via XML markup to specify very precisely formatting instructions to a document by which you might, via which you might generate very clean PDFs with very precise instructions as to where elements should go, what should be italicized, what should not. Sort of a, a publisher's tool for using XML. Um, and we'll use that to some extent for generating some PDFs in the projects this semester. Lecture seven will begin our transition from all things client side to all things server side. And we really begin the course in lectures one through six, focusing more on the client just because it allows us to focus on some of the new stuff, namely all of the XML related stuff. But by lecture seven, we begin to transition to the server side. One, because it opens up a whole new realm, a uh, whole new realm of possibilities, uh, applications and so forth. But two, it's also more fun when it comes to implementing the projects, when you're actually putting something out there, learning a bit about um, application servers and running really your own website for the course's final two projects. We'll look at XQuery and DTD, the first of which is a sort of uh, souped up version of XPath. That is, it's a query language, but much more powerful, similar in spirit, but very different in style to uh, something like SQL as a database language. DTD, which allows you to specify what an XML document must look like. XML schema is sort of a far more verbose version of DTD, which is useful. Um, and uh, quite more expressive than DTD. We'll look at web services in lectures 11 and 12, and this is really just the use of XML underneath the hood for what ultimately are remote procedure-oriented applications, for which XML in some form is simply the underlying delivery mechanism. We'll figure out what we're doing later in the semester here around lecture 13, and in lecture 4 we'll cover, a, in addition to sort of concluding the course, looking back and, and um, and tying everything together, we'll also glance at a few of the more tangential things that are sort of a questionable, they're not compelling in and of themselves, but are worth at least glancing at so that you know at least what else is out there and what, uh, peop what other problems people are trying to solve with things derived from XML. But we'll also spend a bit of time on somewhere in the syllabus, perhaps down here at lecture 13, uh, is something that is similarly XML based, um, and I mentioned it a moment ago, AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript with as uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which if you've ever used Google Maps or any of these web-oriented applications that seem to grab new data without the whole page refreshing, those websites are typically using AJAX these days. And just to give you a sense of the power of this, because it really is one of the coolest things to sort of become popular on the web because it's just making for a much more seamless user experience, much better graphical user interface, even given the constraints of CSS and HTML today. The fact that I'm able to click here and drag and the page refreshes without the little, see I can't even refer to the IE logo or whatnot in Firefox, without the whole page refreshing, that's really sort of the user interface change that Ajax gives you. And what's happening is when I click and drag, an HTTP request is being sent from Firefox, in this instance, to Google server with some information that essentially says, David wants now um, things that are farther to the west, 
what Google then does is respond with a whole bunch of more Git GIFs or JPEGs or the like. Those are all transmitted back to my browser behind the scenes. The browser then typically invokes some JavaScript function in event handler that says, hey, here's the data you requested. And then using JavaScript and a bit of DOM often, that document object model I mentioned earlier, can you then insert that data into the web page, which the browser will then further render. And what you really get is a much more interactive environment, much more similar in spirit to the Flash, Macromedia Flash-based applications that have become popular, but that require a, an additional plugin. The neat thing about Ajax is that pretty much all of the current versions of browsers support it. So we may glance at that as well, because it really is a wonderfully useful thing. And toward courses end, we'll have had the backgrounds on DOM, uh, HTTP, and so forth that will sort of make it all the more applicable. Uh, the projects themselves, so in your hands already is project one. For each of these projects, will you have about three, or in the last case, four weeks um, for the final project. That assumes that you, and you are strongly encouraged with each project to begin it, say, in that first week. If only so that you're setting your own expectations correctly and you know exactly how you should plan those next three weeks. These are not projects that are meant to be done the weekend before of the third week. Um, rather, they're meant to be chipped away at, certainly over the course of two weeks, and ideally over the course of three weeks, so that you maybe take a night or two, certainly early in that three-week period, just to get a sense of what you're in for so that you can budget accordingly. And I will say that you will not enjoy the process, certainly as much as you should, if you're just cramming it into the last couple of days. I do think this course is fun, particularly by way of these projects. And they're meant to be fun and are meant to give you an opportunity to play around with and really apply the kinds of stuff that we try to talk about in lecture, but just isn't nearly as interesting just to hear some guy talking about. You'll get as much instruction, we hope, if not much more so, by way of these projects. And it's really your opportunity to um, walk away from the course with an applied understanding of this stuff. In my first XML parser, you will experience in this handout two components, the first of which will have you build upon a sample XML parser that we put together. An XML parser is simply a program that takes an XML document and parses it. That is, reads it top to bottom, left to right, and then really does something with the data. What you'll see and what we'll discuss next week is that one of the things a parser can do is every time it discovers a sort of conceptually interesting component in an XML document, for instance, here's the first name tag or here's the ID number, it can trigger an event that is call a method. So that's going to be the SACS API where essentially events get thrown, methods get called every time something interesting is encountered in the document. Alternatively, we'll see in project one after lecture three, the DOM's view of the world, such that you can alternatively take an XML document, run it through an XML parser that doesn't just fire off events every time something interesting that's en is encountered, but rather takes the whole document, builds an in-memory tree, and then hands you the root of that tree to do with the document as you will. So that's what an XML parser can do, and that's what it will do in the context of project one and two, or project one, Unfortunately, the parser we hand you isn't quite complete. And as you'll see in the Project 1 specification, among your challenges will be to augment its functionality, namely to uh, handle attributes. Currently, the parser doesn't even know what an attribute is, and if it encounters one in a document, it's just going to choke, and it's going to bail. Um, white space is one of the optional features, as I, I believe, uh, toward the end of the document, which really gives you a sense of what it means to handle white space, but we'll come back to that more later in the course, even though it's not meant to be touted as an interesting feature of XML. And the second component of Project One is to ask that you put aside your own and our joint implementation of your own parser and turn to what would be called an industry standard parser from the Apache project free software known as Xerces, which is terribly common and increasingly um, well performing and is pretty much a parser of choice that you might come courses and pluck off the shelf if you just need something to be done in XML. It is standard in that if you download Java 2 um, 5.0, you're actually getting Xerces with the JDK these days. What you'll see in Projects 1 spec, though, is that we'll often have you download additional software if you choose to develop on your own machines um, so that you have the newest versions of things, which simply tend to be faster and also more stable. But it's common enough, th this implementation in particular, that it comes with Sun's distribution these days. Uh, project 2 is X2. 
in Xtube will you be given a fairly large, a uh, couple hundred kilobyte file of XML data that details all of the tubes, trams, and trains in London's uh, train system, an underground system. And by that I mean you'll have geographic information and name information and color information for all of the tube stops in London, all of the train names, all of the interconnections between them. And among the tasks in Project 2 will be one, to use XSLT to take that XML data and render for the user a web page version of all of the data in that document in sort of a navigable form. So using one web page you can use for instance hyperlinks and jump around and figure out if I'm at Piccadilly Circus, where can I connect to from here? What lines, what colored lines can I connect to from here? How can I, for instance, get outside of the city? So there's a whole bunch of interconnections in that file that you will then somehow represent graphically by way of an, XML, uh, an HTML document or XHTML document. The second part of Xtube has you take that same geographic data and apply your newfound understanding of SVG, scalable vector graphics. This again is a XML-based language via which you can represent lines, polygons, and so forth. And what you'll use that language for is to take that data and render a geographically accurate representation of London's underground. So at the end of that project, what you'll have is a really messy looking, because if you lay out all the tubes, trams, and trains in London and don't actually align things so that it fits nicely on the stickers above the doors and the tube, what you really get is a geographically accurate representation of all of the lines and interconnections and overlays of all of, those, all of the transit system in central London. So it's kind of a neat visualization once you have it um, coded up. Project three, we turn to the server side where you will implement your version of a portal entitled Wahoo. And this portal will have a login mechanism. It will have news feeds of sorts or weather feeds and the ability to navigate among different interests or subscriptions and so forth. In project four, we will dabble with Scamazon, a sort of faux e-commerce site that will allow your users to add things to a shopping cart, to check out, to have that order fulfilled, particularly by way of a web service. The order will be fake fulfilled by a web service that represents a warehouse. So in projects three and four, will you actually begin to use, either on Harvard servers or on your own computer, an instance of Apache Tomcat, which again is sort of an industry standard application server, freely available and fairly well performing these days. So you'll actually be playing with these things, not really in dummy environments, but really um, with software and tools that quite reasonably could be or should be deployed in other domains outside this course. So with that said, what you'll have in each of the project specs is first the assumption that you'll be doing your work on Harvard server. Harvard server uh, is essentially called nice.fas.harvard.edu. For the projects effective immediately, you'll need to get an account on nice.fas.harvard.edu. And if you look at the syllabus, as well as at the second or third question in project one, it tells you the URL to go to so that you can sign up for what's called an FAS computer account, and that'll give you a username and password that one, lets you log into the labs and say the Science Center, but two, lets you log in via SSH to the server on which your work must be submitted. Though the projects are written with the assumption that you'll do your work on NICE, um, the reason being that we've set up the NICE server so that it is completely in accordance with the assumptions technically made by this document. So especially if you're not so good with the command line, or well, if you're not so comfortable, for instance, with configuring your own machine and downloading these different distributions of software, and sh the short of it is that you're being handed an environment that is set up for your use, ready to go, and you can simply start typing away as the, problems, as the projects specify to get yourself up and running and starting with your projects. If, however, you would rather develop on your own Mac, Linux, Windows, or whatever machine, that too is certainly fine. For the most part, all of the software we will use is one, freely available, and two, available for all three of those platforms, at least. If you run Solaris or something else, not everything might be available, but certainly Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, you are A-OK. -okay. So what you'll find at the end of these projects, too, is an appendix that essentially tells you what I did on nice.fas to get everything in the configuration that it is on the server for you. I would, would actually encourage you to work on your own machines because I think there's an additional skill to be derived, an additional level of comfort to be derived, frankly, from doing a lot of even this, the, the, the logistical setup of this stuff yourself. Because it's actually, I think, a valuable lesson if you're not already comfortable with this sort of thing, so that when you exit the course, 
it, you won't need to tell your boss or your friend, okay, I know how to code this if you can just give me a server like E259s was set up. If you follow these appendices and actually configure your machine in, your, um, in the manner prescribed, you'll exit the course, I think, with an additional understanding as to just how you yourself go make something happen. And that in and of itself has value, I think. You will be expected to compile execute and submit your projects on nice.fas, but because we're using Java, frankly, and all of these tools that are available for all of these platforms, it should just work. You might occasionally run into the obscure backslash r backslash n issue or something stupid like that, but it is expected that you and required that you submit on nice, but for the most part, if you just SFTP your files up to the Harvard server, if you've developed them on your computer, run the same commands on nice.fas, should usually work. And if it doesn't, you need to spend a bit of time figuring out why it's not working. But it should be, in the ideal, fairly transparent. I mean, case in point, well, I tested just last night these precise directions, taking the code from nice.fas, downloading it to my own uh, Windows machine, installing the newest version of the JDK and the software prescribed in the appendix, double click things, type the command, and bam. So it worked for me. So. Good luck um, as well. And what I would encourage you to do is to communicate with each other, not only me, but also each other by way of the course's listserv, whose address I'll put up in a moment, because the course really is meant to be not so much a communal effort when it comes to the implementation of the projects, but certainly for the tangential details, like, hey, I have a Linux box, and for some reason I'm getting command not found, even though I followed these directions. Just helping each other debug questions that people might otherwise turn to, say, Usenet for, is certainly encouraged. So you're encouraged to work in, those, in that sense together on the projects, but when it comes to the actual content, it's meant to be done individually. So the final project is really an opportunity for you to do anything that interests you related to XML. And it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to Java. If you have a penchant for some other language or at work have been inspired to solve some problem in for instance, the language that you must use there, so long as it's related somehow to what the course is covered as it relates to XML, that should be fine. And we'll walk you through the process of just proposing something, checking in with you by way of a status report, but really this is a four or five week opportunity for you to do as you wish with this and really explore something that you thought was fun that can ultimately amount to building upon one of the course's projects, but ideally coming up with something on your own. And if you're curious, especially if you're still considering whether to take the course, if you pull up the course's website under the final, under the projects link, not only one does the website have everything we'll distribute in class on paper, you'll have PDFs and so forth there. If you scroll down to where the final project spec is available, what I've also done is posted the uh, proposals from the past two or three semesters worth of students. So if you want to get sort of an indirect sense of what the course is about or what former students exited the course with an appreciation of, you can flip through their proposals. And they don't necessarily represent what the student ultimately pulled off. Some of them were perhaps a bit overly ambitious, as tends to be the case with final projects. But you'll certainly get a sense of the kinds of things people were tackling toward the course's end. Um, the final project spec itself, incidentally, is here. So you don't often get the final project handed out on day one, but here you have it. Um, you're not expected to consider this or mull on this really for a couple of months. It's just meant to put it out there for you. Exams, I'm sure you are happier to hear me say there are neither, there's neither midterm nor final exam. Again, the course's emphasis is on implementation and application of the things we discussed by way of those projects. There are no required books. Um, you can certainly take this course without investing in any cost of these books because there's a great number of resources online, all of them free. If, however, you're the type of learner who prefers to have a book by your side, the four books that I would propose you consider, and all of these are on reserve in Grossman Library, which is upstairs at the end of the hall, so you can check them out not check them out, but look at them in advance if you want to get a sense of them or take a look at borders or the like. This first book is a useful book for, say, lectures seven and beyond, really projects three and four and beyond, because it's one of the canonical texts as, uh, in the domain of Java servlets and JSPs. It assumes you know Java, but it really puts a reference in front of you for that kind of server-side development. However, that same book, I believe, in its prior edition is available for free as PDFs 
and that should be linked on the course's website via the resources link. Um, Essential XML Quick Reference and XML Pocket Consultant, these are just sort of useful reference books. You can get the same exact information with an intelligent Google query, but again, if you like just having a reference there or sort of want to refresh yourself, those of all the ridiculous number of XML books that are out there, I think are pretty good um, references and they cover a lot of the course's content, but not all of it. The one book, that I might go so far as to recommend you consider getting because it's a wonderful reference whose information is harder to gather, certainly in one place online, is this last book by Michael Kay, XSLT's Programmer's Reference. Um, it's a thick book, and it's one of those books where the author's got his name, a uh, face on the cover, one of those series, but it's a really wonderful book, and Michael Kay has been one of the foremost fellows when it comes to the discussion, the implementation, and so forth of the XSLT specs, realized that his current edition, which is the third edition, focuses on XSLT 2.0. And we'll talk about this a bit more in lectures four and five. We will likely be emphasizing more XSLT 1.0 only because to this day, the JDK, um, the JDK itself has only committed, and Xerces and Zalen, the Apache group, has only committed to implementing XSLT 1.0, largely because the XSLT 2.0 spec is still somewhat in flux. And I'm sort of loath to put a lot of material in front of us that one might just change at the end of the course and two won't necessarily be supported in the environments that you might want to work. The upside of that is that if you go on something like Amazon, you can buy for like $1.75 the second edition of this book, which is more than sufficient. And frankly, you're already getting 800 pages or so. And it's a wonderful reference. But just realize the newer editions about a version of the language that doesn't have nearly as widespread support but more on that in uh, lectures four and five. So this is just a screenshot of the terminal that you would connect to when using nice.fas. If you've never SSH'd before, if you've never used a command line uh, prompt, if you've never used the Linux or Unix or some variant thereof, you might want to talk to me or a savvy friend just about what this entails. It's not complicated, and frankly, if you develop on your own client machine, you can get away with just uploading your files, running a couple of commands at the prompt to make sure they work, and then submit, and you don't really have to pick up this particular skill, if you will, but um, it's certainly easier. And at this point, you, we will certainly assume a savvy with command line instructions and so forth. But chat with me if you have questions as to your comfort with that sort of thing. The course's website is very much intended to be a semester-long resource, particularly two of its links. The software page has links to, we hope, the current versions of everything that we'll be using or suggesting or uh, discussing in the course, uh, organized by a whole bunch of categories. So you'll see in the Project One spec, in the appendix, if you choose to download the software yourself, and I say uh, download via the course's website, what I mean is go right here and we'll save you the trouble of Google searching and finding links and so forth, and I'll try to offer parenthetically even the file name sometimes of the files you want to download, since some of these sites are not so clear as to what you should be downloading. But if you ever have questions as to what you want to download, by all means email the listserv and either I or perhaps a fellow student can reply. The resources tab is meant to be the other um, strongly encouraged resource for two reasons. One, the first section here are the APIs, which we'll make frequent use of starting with project one and then with projects three and four. For instance, and this is, should perhaps be familiar already, this is just the J2SC 5.0 API, which every good Java programmer should know about. But we'll also look at the API that's specific to Java servlets which again is a subset of J2EE, will make use to some extent of Xerces, which again is the standard XML parser we'll be using, its API, and then there's a couple of others that we'll make use of as well. But that's just there as quick access for you. And then not only are there references on this page, there are also a number of tutorials linked. So because we don't require books and because there's so much avail information available online, what we encourage you to do either before or after each lecture, if you're so inclined, is to self-guide yourself with readings that appeal to you. So what we've tried to do in each of these categories is link to a tutorial, a couple of tutorials that are topic, and if you'd like to get more exposure than what you see in lecture or hear in lecture on a particular topic, I would start here. 
certainly. And that should be a useful supplement or preparation for what we're going to do each week in class. Um, and I'm certainly happy to offer suggestions, especially if you feel like you've exited a couple of weeks and are feeling a little rusty or uncertain with some topic, I can certainly point you in some direction. But also on the website, are links to everything handed out in lectures, everything handed out with respect to projects. So not only will there be PDFs, but there's also the source code for the projects in zip and tar format. Um, the syllabus is there as well. And finally, a link to accessing your grades. So you can double check that our official records are consistent with what you think you, your grade was on some aspect. Um, email list, if, uh, for if you want to contact me just about course material, let me suggest you go via this route just so that it gets logged appropriately so that we can keep track of who's been writing and what I need to reply to. And the listserv is something that a number of you have already quite impressively signed up for and in advance of the course. As Project One uh, specifies, there's a link on the course's website to listserv with directions for subscribing. And this is simply meant to be a forum, not only for me to answer questions that come up, but for you to pose and also yourselves answer questions that might come up. And again, exercise discretion when it comes to talking about something that probably shouldn't be asked in a public forum. For instance, here's 100 lines of my code. Can you help me debug it? Not really a question you should pose to your classmates in the academic setting, but you could instead email that to me. But if you have some question as to why your environment variables messed up or uh, you know, what's the method I should use to invoke this feature, I mean, those kinds of questions, be reasonable certainly, can certainly be posed to the listserv. And with a class of 30 plus registered students, you'll have uh, even more eyes on the problem than just mine. So you are strongly encouraged to make use of the listserv. Do take a look at the segment on academic honesty and the syllabus as it relates to the projects and what is to be submitted and what is not to be submitted. And finally, brownie points. Um, stuff changes pretty fast and we try hard, I try hard to make sure the links on the website don't become out of date to either version numbers or online resources. So by all means, if you ever notice anything awry on the site, please do just drop me a note and we will redress. That said, any questions? Well, what's there to do already? So you have projects one and the final project already in hand. So technically, there is stuff you could do. I would say that those two, the first project, project one, covers material that you're not expected to even know much about until the beginning of next week. So it's really in lectures two and three that will introduce the material that project one covers. But what I would encourage you to do is read over project one, certainly if you're on the fence about the course, because you'll get a sense of what the project's about. But certainly the first half dozen or so questions in project one are about holding your hand and signing up for the listserv, getting your FAS account. And that stuff you should certainly do before week. But otherwise, don't, with this project, don't feel that you really need to dive into it until after next week's lecture. And for those of you wondering exactly the types of coding that will be on these project, projects, one, project one is entirely Java oriented. And for those of you coming in with somewhat weak Java backgrounds, you might feel somewhat hard hit. I leave it to you to decide just how well you want to try to keep up with that. Project two has absolutely no Java. In that project, we will explore it, um, primarily in XML, XSLT, SVG, and a couple of other things. In project three, we'll come back to the world of Java by way of the server side development, where I think it'll be a little more easygoing because it, won't, it will be more about um, the new server side material that we're assuming you haven't seen before. So just realize that you are hit hard you're hit with Java up front, but I'll leave it to you to um, assess your own level of comfort with that. But having the project in hand should give you a sense. Um, this might be covered on the website, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of exceptions, uh, yes, no, an excellent question. So what we do each week is have sort of casual section time um, for convenience. And so many people come to campus and probably prefer to once a week. What we do is after lecture, not tonight's lecture, but after next week's lecture and thereafter, what we'll do is gather in another room in this building for an hour where really I'll walk the interested students through the current project source code, really give you a sense of where you might want to dive in first, what you really need to do with the project. We record those not on video, but on audio. So students who simply don't want to stick around or can't stick around do have a resource. And I'll also post uh, notes every couple of weeks germane to each project online that were made by a former teaching fellow so that you actually have a sort of a, a getting started guide. So to be clear, starting next week after lecture, we'll figure out the room, but we'll um, have an optional section where really I'll just walk you through the project or the current project 
um, and field questions about it. Those of you who are here locally know too that the course is being filmed since we have a number of students um, partaking at a distance. Those videos are accessible to you as well. They're available via a real video version with um, synchronized uh, a HTML based slideshow of slides synchronized with it for your commuting and jogging convenience we will also be podcasting the course in um, audio and likely video format so that even though you'll sacrifice the higher res videos and won't have the synchronized slides you'll at least have the ability to tune in on the MBTA or while you go to your jog if you actually want to hear me while while jogging. But it was something we tried last year with last semester students and even if they didn't use it as the primary mechanism of reviewing or watching material it did seem to be um, appreciated so we will try that out again. So more on that starting next week via the website. Other questions? Uh, do you always print the, the lecture notes? <laughs> yes but not that large. Yes you will always have the lecture notes but in a much more tree friendly format. Other questions? All right, well, I will stick around for a while if you want to come up and ask questions. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.